Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and in this video, I'll discuss biotechnology and genomics. This is the eighth in a series of 10 lessons held as part of my general genetics course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include describing biotechnology uses in medicine and agriculture. We'll talk about genomics, genetic maps and mapping methods. We'll be describing three types of sequencing, including whole genome sequencing and pharmacogenomics and systems biology. And finally, we'll describe proteomes and protein signatures. The exploration of nucleic acids began with the identification of DNA and later expanded to the study of genes and DNA fragments. Eventually, this led to the field of genomics. Genomics involves the comprehensive examination of entire genomes, including all the genes, their nucleotide sequences, the way they're organized, the way they interact within the species and between species. And sequencing technology has, of course, significantly contributed to the advancements in genomics. Through DNA sequencing, scientists can decode the genetic information contained within the DNA of living organisms, and this gives insights into their characteristics and behaviors. Genomics has found diverse applications in anthropology and medicine, aiding in the understanding of human evolution and offering promising prospects for personalized medical treatments in the future. Biotechnology is the application of biological processes and organisms to develop technological solutions. Biotechnology has a rich history with early applications dating back centuries. However, it is in modern times that biotechnology finds primary applications in medicine like vaccine and antibiotic production, as well as in agriculture where genetic modification of crops is used to increase yields. And also biotechnologies used in industry for such applications as fermentation of cheeses, wines, oil spill treatments, and also biofuel, biofuel productions. In order to study nucleic acids, it's first necessary to isolate them and <clears throat> extract them from the cells. When extracting DNA or RNA, the process involves several steps. First, you need a lysis buffer, which is usually mostly detergent and water, um, but it's used to break down the cell lipids and the membranes. And then the sample is treated with enzymes like proteases and ribonucleases. After that, the remaining material undergoes centrifugation. So you put it in the centrifuge, you spin around for like several minutes, and the supernatant, the liquid part, has the DNA or the RNA in it. And then to create the strands, you know, to get these linear strands, you subject the supernatant to ethanol precipitation. It helps to purify and make the DNA ready for manipulation. Um, gel electrophoresis is used to visualize DNA strands. Um, so you load DNA fragments into a gel and then you electrify the gel and DNA has a negative charge so it moves towards the positive pole and as the DNA fragments migrate the gel acts as kind of like a sieve and it sorts the fragments by size. The smaller fragments move more easily and they travel further and faster and the larger fragments travel slower so that it separates in that way and this allows scientists to analyze and visualize the DNA fragments based on their size. Figure 17.3 is showing, th this is actually a really simplified version, but it's the basics behind every type of DNA extraction. You first need, you got to get the DNA out of the cells. So you lyse the cells, and then you have to find a way to separate the DNA from all of the proteins and, and other stuff that's in the cells that you don't want. So that's what the enzymes are for. And then the centrifugation physically separates those things. And then you end up with purified. <clears throat> Figure 17.4 is showing the results of a gel electrophoresis. So you have, these are marker lanes. So you've had restriction enzymes cut DNA in known locations. And it gives all of these little bands where you can judge your sample based on its location in the marker lane to tell what size it is, how many base pairs it is, and length. 
DNA amplification is done by a PCR. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's used to replicate a specific sequence of DNA, a target sequence. It involves using primers. Primers are short pieces of DNA that are complementary to the ends, the forward and the reverse ends of your target sequence. So they're, they're usually about 20 nucleotides in length, and it targets the five prime end of the forward and then the same for the reverse and the primers along with genomic DNA, TAC polymerase, and deoxynucleotides. They're all put into a reaction mixture and they're subjected to alternating hotter and colder temperatures which denatures and anneals the DNA strands that opens and closes them. The TAC polymerase is a special kind of DNA polymerase. It's the DNA polymerase that comes from a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. He's a thermophilic, lives in hot springs. So his DNA polymerase can tolerate really high temperatures, and high temperatures are used routinely in PCR. So that's why we use that. So during PCR, the mixture with all of the primers, genomic DNA, TAC polymerase, deoxynucleotides, is subjected to temperature cycles, like I was saying. And that TAC polymerase is what adds the new nucleotides to the primers and helps to regulate the target DNA sequence. And it's repeated multiple times and it ends up with an exponential amplification of, of the target sequence. At the we can also amplify fragments from an RNA template using what is called reverse transcriptase PCR. RT-PCR involves creating complementary DNA, cDNA template from RNA by incorporating DNA nucleotides through a process called reverse transcription. An enzyme called reverse transcriptase facilitates this step. Once the cDNA is synthesized, the regular PCR can be used to amplify the new strand. RT-PCR is really useful for studying gene expression, viral infections, and RNA-based diseases. It allows uh, researchers to analyze RNA molecules similar to standard PCR. PCR's analysis of DNA. Figure 17.5 is showing the PCR reactions. So you have primers, the little short pieces of complementary DNA. They bind with the genomic DNA using the TAC polymerase and the deoxynucleotides that you add to the reaction mixture. And then reverse transcriptase PCR, the RT-PCR, is very similar to PCR, but cDNA is made from an RNA template instead of a DNA template before the PCR begins. Hybridization is a molecular biology technique where two single-stranded DNA or RNA molecules with complementary sequences come together to form a stable double-stranded molecule. It's a fundamental process used in various applications like DNA and RNA detection, gene expression analysis, and identifying specific DNA or RNA sequences within a sample. Southern blotting is a lab technique that's used to detect specific DNA sequences in a sample. It involves several steps, including DNA digestion, gel electrophoresis, uh, transfer of the DNA to a gel, and then hybridization with a labeled DNA probe that's complementary to the target sequence. So southern blotting allows researchers to identify and analyze DNA fragments of interest. Um, northern blotting is similar similar to southern blotting, but it's used to detect specific RNA molecules. Northern blotting involves separating RNA molecules based on size, again using gel electrophoresis, then transferring the RNA to a solid support, usually a membrane, hybridizing the RNA with a labeled DNA or RNA probe that's complementary to the target RNA sequence. And um, northern blotting is commonly used to study gene expression and mRNA levels in biological samples. Figure 17.6 is giving an overview
overview of southern blotting and how it's used to find DNA. So they separate the DNA fragments on a gel. They transfer that to a nylon membrane. They incubate it with a probe that's complementary to the sequence that they're looking for. And then northern blotting, similar to that, but they're looking at RNA instead of DNA. And then another technique that's similar to that is western blotting. Western blotting is using the exact same fundamental technique, but they are using them to detect proteins and antibodies. Plasmids occur naturally in bacteria. So, for example, E. coli. And plasmids have genes that confer advantageous traits like antibiotic resistance. Scientists have repurposed and engineered plasmids as vectors for molecular cloning and for large-scale production of reagents like insulin and human growth hormone. Their effectiveness is partly due to something called the multiple cloning site, MCS. The MCS is a short DNA sequence that contains multiple sites that are reorganized and cut by restriction endonucleases, which are are enzymes that identify a specific DNA sequence, such as those found in the MCS. When the restriction endonucleases cut the DNA, it creates this like two to four base overhang, and that's called the sticky end. And sticky ends can bind or anneal with a complementary strand of DNA. This unique property of plasmids and the precise splicing facilitated by specific specific endonucleases allow scientists to perform highly precise DNA manipulation. They can insert specific DNA sequences into the plasmids at the desired location using the sticky ends, create recombinant DNA molecules, and then use this for genetic engineering, gene cloning, um, and many other biotechnological applications. Cellular cloning occurs naturally in unicellular organisms like bacteria and yeast through binary fission, where the genetic material replicates via mitosis to create an identical clone. A common technique in genetic engineering is to insert a new gene into a loop of bacterial DNA called a plasmid. The molecular tool used to cut DNA is a restriction enzyme such as ECOR1. The enzyme has a precise shape that allows it to run along the groove of the double helix, scanning, in the case of ECOR1, for the base letter sequence GAATTC. The enzyme then cuts the plasmid at this specific point, allowing a new piece of DNA to be inserted. When it cuts, ECOR1 leaves a sticky end. This helps the new gene to attach. The joins are then stitched together by another enzyme called DNA ligase. The genetically engineered bacteria is grown in a culture medium. Very quickly, large numbers of the bacteria can be produced, each with a copy of the inserted gene. The bacteria duly manufacture whatever protein the gene codes for, and so the desired product is made. Reproductive cloning involves creating an exact copy of a multicellular organism. And to achieve this, they start by replacing the haploid nucleus of an egg with a diploid nucleus from the organism they want to clone. Once that's done, the egg cell develops into a zygote as if it had been fertilized normally. And the resulting organism grows that grows from the zygote is a genetic clone of the original organism. And they, so they have identical genetic information. Now, on the other hand, um, genetic engineering is where an organism's genotype is altered using recombinant DNA technology. This is typically achieved through the use of vectors generated by molecular cloning techniques. The foreign DNA in the form of recombinant DNA vectors is added to the organism, and the organism is commonly known as a genetically modified organism because it's received this modified DNA. Genetic engineering allows scientists to introduce specific genes or to modify existing genes, and this is used to enhance 
the desired traits or create organism with novel characteristics for various applications in agriculture, medicine, and biotechnology. Uh, figure 17.8 is given an example of reproductive cloning. Um, Dolly was the first mammal to ever be cloned. In order to make Dolly, they removed the nucleus from a donor egg cell, and then they introduced the nucleus from a second sheep into the cell, which divided to the blastocyst stage before they then implanted the blastocyst into a surrogate mother. Dolly actually lived for about seven years before she ended up dying of respiratory complications. Um, cloned animals like horses and bulls and goats, that they've all been successfully produced since Dolly. This was in the 90s. Um, but again, they often exhibit some physical abnormalities. While there's been attempts to create cloned human embryos, uh, for therapeutic stem cell purposes. Of course, there are ethical concerns surrounding reproductive cloning, um, but new discoveries regarding stem cells in the skin are offering potential applications in treating skin diseases and nerve damage. No fetus is required. That's good. Genetic engineering modifies an organism's genome using recombinant DNA to achieve desired traits. So this is commonly done by adding foreign DNA through recombination DNA vectors, plasmids, and then you end up with what is known as a GMO, genetically modified organism. And then if foreign DNA is transferred from one organism to the other, then that becomes a transgenic organism, and you can have transgenic plants and animals. Since the 1970s, scientists have genetically modified bacteria, plants, animals for academia, medicine, agriculture, and industry purposes. Common processed foods in the U.S., such as Roundup Ready soybeans and boro-resistant corn, contain GMOs. In the field of plant biotech technology. Agrobacterium tumefaciens plays a key role in transformation of plants. So this bacteria possesses tumor-inducing plasmids that allow it to transfer genetic material into plant cells. And through this process, scientists can introduce desired genes into plants to confer specific traits like resistance, resistance to pests. And an example of this would be the insecticide Bacillus thuringiensis Bt into plants, which gives them to the ability to produce a natural toxin that's harmful to insects, but it's safe for humans. Another remarkable achievement is the creation of the flavor saver tomato, which was one of the first genetically modified tomatoes that developed um, to have a longer shelf life through the inhibition of ripening. And then I actually do have a video that helps to describe exactly exactly how that was done and it's very interesting and short i promise in this video we'll be talking about the antisense rna technology and and its use in the plant biotechnological purposes as a tomato ripens decreases in stored starch content and loss of tardier pressure are factors in the ripening process however one of the main contributors to this process is thought to be the changes in the structure of pectin which is present in the cell wall an enzyme called polygalacturonase or PG correlates best with the softening of the tomato fruits. The activity of this PG increases during the ripening, mainly degrades the pectin of the cell wall, thus changes the construction of the outer membrane of this food. In an immature tomato, there are low levels of PG encoding mRNA, which is a messenger RNA which code for the protein which is PG or polyglucuronase. Now this is the DNA part and this is the sense DNA, this is the antisense DNA strand and RNA polymers can sit on and produce the mRNA molecule from this DNA. Now the DNA is transcribed into mRNA from one strand of the double helix called the sense strand. The PG mRNA is then transported outside the nucleus to the cytoplasm where the code uh, is translated into the PG protein by the ribosome. Now this is the ribosome, this mRNA will be translated to the desired proteins which are the polyglucuronase. Now these are the PG proteins. As the ripening process continues, more and more copies of PG mRNAs are made in the cell nucleus resulting in the PG in the plant which leads to more ripening of the food. 
Researchers wanted to find a way to delay the ripening process in tomatoes to produce a ripe fruit that remains intact for extended period of time. The use of antisense RNA technology allowed them to do this very important task. Normally, when the DNA is transcribed into mRNA, only one strand of the double helix is issued or used. This strand is called the coding strand or the sense strand. Now, this is the coding strand. In this case, it is called the sense strand. As in the opposite of the sense, it is called the antisense strand or the non-coding strand. Researchers used the information about the sense strand to create a gene in, in, in reverse orientation, also called the antisense gene. Now, you can see here, if we produce an antisense gene, that will look like this. So, there will be no difference in the antisense region, but the gene which code for here, we, as you can see here, uh, the gene which, which actually uh, coding for uh, the sense region will be changed, right? So, in this case, we can see these are the antisense region. This is the sense in that case. So it just inverts the situation in such a way that the sense, sense genes becomes antisense and the antisense becomes sensed. Note that just like the beginning of the DNA strand, this mRNA are complementary and in, in, in reverse orientation. Now here in this case, it is from the 3 prime to 5 prime, the actual uh, sense uh, strand. And in this case, it is from 5 prime to 3 prime. Now, the result of the antisense mRNA being added in the RNA RNA complex is unstable and is also more difficult to transport out to the nu from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. To be effective, in most cases, there must be a larger number of antisense mRNA compared to the sense mRNA. This increases the chance that an RNA RNA complex will form. Now, as we have seen, that RNA-RNA complex are formed, and also some of these RNA molecules are released, and they will be translated to PG proteins inside the cytosol. And some of them are forming the unstable RNA-RNA complex. Some PG mRNA less than 1% will irreversibly still make it outside the nucleus to be translated by the ribosome. However, the amount of PG protein that will be produced is not enough to do this usual job, which means pectin will not be degraded. The end result is a tomato that softens more slowly and has some processing advantages. It is more resistant to cracking, mechanical damage, and also the fungus. This is all about the antisense RNA technology, and I hope it will help you. Genetic diagnosis involves testing for suspected genetic defects before administering a treatment. So genetic testing helps to determine the genetic basis of diseases and guides treatment plans. Gene therapy in particular focuses on targeting specific diseases at the genetic level, which, which is giving doctors promising avenues for treatments. So for example, by analyzing the genetic makeup of specific types of cancer, doctors can identify unique traits and then tailor treatment options accordingly. These advanced Advancements in gene diagnosis and gene therapy have the potential to revolutionize medical practices, providing more precise and tailored approaches to combating diseases and improving patient outcomes. Reverse genetics and gene targeting techniques. Okay, so quickly, I just want to explain what reverse genetics means. Um, you have genetics, like normal forward genetics is where, like Mendel, you had a phenotype and you were trying to figure out the gene or group of genes that made that phenotype. In reverse genetics, you know the genotype, you know the genes, and you're trying to figure out what those genes do to affect the phenotype. So instead of going from phenotype to genotype, in reverse genetics, you're going from genotype to phenotype. Okay, so that's all that means. Um, so reverse genetics and gene targeting techniques are used to study genomics, um, which involves examining the complete set of genes, their nucleotide sequences, their organization and interactions within and between species. Genomic mapping is a key component of that. So genomic
Genomic mapping reveals the location of genes on the chromosome, as well as the physical distance between the genes or different genetic markers, and that's called physical mapping. So you have genetic mapping and you have physical mapping. Genetic markers are specific genes or sequences found on a chromosome that demonstrate genetic linkage, which means that they co-segregate with a particular trait. Linkage analysis utilizes the recombination frequency between genes to determine whether they are linked or if they show independent assortment. So these are kind of advanced techniques, but researchers use them to gain valuable insights into the genetic basis of traits and diseases, and they're helping to unravel the complexities of genomics and targeted genetic therapies in the future. Figure 17.11 is, again, we've seen this figure a few times. It's just showing how crossover is happening at different locations on the chromosomes during recombination. And it's saying that the recombination between the genes is more frequent between A and B than it is between B and C because A and B are further apart than B and C, right? A and B, B and C you can see how B and C are going to be inherited together more often than not, whereas A and B, you don't see them being linked together that way. Genetic linkage maps utilize various techniques in order to map the genes and the genetic markers. Restriction fragment length polymorphisms, RFLPs, analyze differences in DNA fragment sizes resulting from genetic variations. Variable number of tandem repeats repeats, the VNTRs, involve detecting variations in the number of repeated DNA sequences. Microsatellite polymorphisms, microsatellite genotyping, identifies the differences in the lengths of short repeated DNA sequences. So again, these are non-coding regions. Um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, SNPs, detect single base differences in DNA sequences. And then while well, genetic maps give an overall picture. The physical maps offer intricate details about the physical distances between the genetic markers, and it's measured in terms of the number of base pairs. So it's very, very specific. There are several methods used to construct physical maps. So things like radiation hybrid mapping, sequence mapping, and cytogenetic mapping. Radiation hybrid mapping uses radiation to fragment the chromosomes and allows for ordering of markers based on their proximity. Sequence mapping directly determines the DNA sequence from genomic regions. Genomic libraries store and organize large DNA fragments representing the entire genome. Complementary DNA libraries, cDNA libraries, contain DNA copies of expressed genes, helping to identify genes involved in specific processes. Express sequence tags, ESTs, identify partial sequences of expressed genes, enabling gene expression analysis. And cytogenetic mapping visualizes genes' locations on chromosomes using microscopic techniques. Figure 1712 is showing a cytogenetic map. Uh, the bands on a cytogenetic map represent different regions of the chromosome, each with specific characteristics. So the dark bands, also known as G bands, are rich in the DNA base pairs adenine and thymine, and this makes them more susceptible to the staining that's used. And they tend to be gene-poor regions of the chromosome, often associated with heterochromatin, a, a tightly packed form of DNA that's less accessible for gene expression. The light bands, they're also called R bands, and they're rich in the DNA base pairs guanine and cytosine. These bands are gene-rich regions of the chromosome, and they're associated with euchromatin, which is a less compact form of DNA. So that makes it more accessible for gene expression. Integrating genetic and physical maps is essential if you want to comprehensively study genomes. And by combining information from both mapping techniques, we can gain a deeper understanding of the relationship between genes 
genes and their physical positions on the chromosome. Um, this integrated approach helps identify the location of disease-causing genes and enables further investigation into their function and their mechanisms. As researchers continue to develop more advanced mapping techniques and technologies, the field of genomics keeps expanding. Genome mapping efforts are ongoing and data generated from labs worldwide are compi compiled in central databases such as uh, GenBank at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI. Efforts are being made to improve accessibility to this wealth of information, facilitating research collaborations and providing valuable resources for the scientific community and the general public. Moreover, the application of whole genome sequencing has revolutionized the field of medical sciences. This technique, whole genome sequencing, involves determining the complete DNA sequence of an organism's genome. Genome. Whole genome sequencing serves as a powerful tool for investigating the genetic basis of various diseases. And it allows scientists to analyze an individual's entire genome and identify potential disease-causing genetic variations. Various methods are employed, but all of them incorporate some variation of the original old-school chain termination or Sanger dideoxy sequencing method. Right, so this is the fundamental sequencing technique we've already talked about this, um, but it's employed in modern sequencing projects. It's the chain termination method, also known as dideoxy Sanger sequencing, um, and it was developed in the 1970s. And the method involves DNA replication of a single-stranded template using a primer, regular deoxynucleotides, and a small portion of fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotides. The dideoxynucleotides lack that hydroxyl group, at the site where another nucleotide typically attaches, and this causes termination of the DNA replication whenever these dideoxynucleotides are incorporated into the growing strand. So you end up with multiple short replicated DNA strands, each terminating at different points, different locations, different times during replication, and then gel electrophoresis is used to separate the strands, creating a ladder-like pattern due to varying sizes and by associating each band's color with the specific dideoxynucleotide that was used, scientists can identify the DNA strain sequence, and this method has significantly advanced the study of genetics and genomics. Other sequencing methods include shotgun sequencing, um, pairwise end sequencing. So in shotgun sequencing, DNA fragments are randomly cut into smaller pieces, and all segments are sequenced using the chain sequencing method. By analyzing the overlapping sequences, scientists then can reconstruct the entire genome, forming a larger sequence known as a contig, right, a DNA contig. Pairwise end sequencing is a more cumbersome but informative approach. It involves analyzing both ends of each fragment for overlaps, allowing for easier sequence reconstruction. And now a newer advancement is what is called next generation sequencing. It's also called deep sequencing or massively parallel sequencing. And it came around in 2005. Next generation sequencing uses automated low cost sequencers capable of rapidly sequencing hundreds of thousands or even millions of short DNA fragments, like short being from 25 to 500 base pairs in a day. So the sequence Sequencers utilize sophisticated software to arrange the fragments in order, making the process more efficient and accessible for genome analysis. So let's have a look, a little refresher and a visualization of what it looks like to use a computer and lasers and stuff to figure out the genome. Let's back up a bit. What is a genome? Well, a genome is all the genes plus some extra that make up an organism. Genes are made up of DNA, and DNA is made up of long paired strands of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Your genome is the code that your cells use to know how to behave. Cells interacting together make tissues. Tissues cooperating with each other make organs. Organs cooperating with each other make an organism. You. So, you are who you are in large part because of your genome. The first human genome was sequenced 10 years ago and was no easy task. It took two decades to complete, 
required the effort of hundreds of scientists across dozens of countries and cost over $3 billion. But someday, very soon, it will be possible to know the sequence of letters that make up your own personal genome all in a matter of minutes, and for less than the cost of a pretty nice birthday present. How is that possible? Let's take a closer look. Knowing the sequence of the billions of letters that make up your genome is the goal of genome sequencing. A genome is both really, really big and very, very small. The individual letters of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, are only 8 or 10 atoms wide, and they're all packed together into a clump, like a ball of yarn. So, to get all that information out of that tiny space, scientists first have to break the long string of DNA down into smaller pieces. Each of these pieces is then separated in space and sequenced individually. But how? It's helpful to remember that DNA binds to other DNA if the sequences are the exact opposite of each other. A's bind to T's, and T's bind to A's. G's bind to C's, and C's to G's. If the A, T, G, C sequence of two pieces of DNA are exact opposites, they stick together. Because the genome pieces are so very small, we need some way to increase the signal we can detect from each of the individual letters. In the most common method, scientists use enzymes to make thousands of copies of each genome piece. So we now have thousands of replicas of each of the genome pieces, all with the same sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. But we have to read them all somehow. To do this, we need to make a batch of special letters, each with a distinct color. A mixture of these special colored letters and enzymes are then added to the genome we're trying to read. At each spot on the genome, one of the special letters binds to its opposite letter. So we now have a double-stranded piece of DNA with a colorful spot at each letter. Scientists then take pictures of each snippet of genome. Seeing the order of the colors allows us to read the sequence. The sequences of each of these millions of pieces of DNA are stitched together using computer programs to create a complete sequence of the entire genome. This isn't the only way to read the letter sequences of pieces of DNA, but it's one of the most common. Of course, just reading the letters in the genome doesn't tell us much. It's kind of like looking through a book written in a language you don't speak. You can recognize all the letters, but still have no idea what's going on. So the next step is to decipher what the sequence means, how your genome and my genome are different. Interpreting the genes of the genome is the part scientists are still working on. While not every difference is consequential, the sum of these differences is responsible for differences in how we look, what we like, how we act, and even how likely we are to get sick or respond to specific medicines. Better understanding of how disparities between our genomes account for these differences is sure to change the way we think, not only about how doctors treat their patients, but also how we treat each other. Fred Sanger, from same Sanger, from Sanger Sequencing, was the first person to sequence a genome, and he did it with the bacterial virus. It's a bacteriophage FX174, and that genome was about 5,400 base pairs. In the 1980s, an American biotechnologist and geneticist, Craig Venter, sequenced the bacteria Haemophilus influenzae. The yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae was a significant challenge because it had a very big genome. Um, it took about 74 different labs across the world collaborating to sequence Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, but that was done in 1996. And then by 97, the genomes of E. coli and Saccharomyces were available for researchers to use. And currently, we have the genomes of the mouse, the fruit fly, uh, nematodes, and humans. Model organisms 
are tools that are used in basic research applicable to genetically similar species. A genome annotation is uh, attaching biological information to gene sequences, and it aids in basic experiments like designing PCR primers and RNA targets in molecular biology. DNA microarrays are scientific tools used to analyze gene expression by studying fixed DNA fragments on a glass slide or a silicone chip, silicon chip, and identifying active genes and sequences. Microarrays detect nearly a million genotypic abnormalities, while whole genome sequencing provides information about 6 billion base pairs in the human genome. While exploring medical applications of genome sequencing is fascinating, the field focuses on abnormal gene function, and understanding the entire genome can enable researchers to identify future onset diseases and genetic disorders early, leading to informed decisions about lifestyle and medication, family planning. Although genomics is still in its early stages, someday whole genome sequencing may become routine, like a routine screen in newborns that can detect genetic abnormalities. This figure is showing how a DNA microarray is performed. To start, short DNA sequences called probes are synthesized for specific gene studies. And the probes are about 20 to 25 nucleotides long and represent unique gene sequences. Probes are printed on a solid surface, creating an array with thousands of spots, and each spot is for a different gene. Biological samples are processed to extract RNA, reflecting gene expression in the sample. So the extracted RNA is labeled with different fluorescent colors for comparison between the test samples and the reference samples. RNA is applied to the DNA microarray, hybridizing two complementary DNA probes with fluorescence indicating gene expression. So literally, the color, you can see the color. If it's this color, it's not there. If it's this color, it's present in both cells. If, if it's this one, it's only in normal cells. If it's that one, it's only in disease cells. A laser scanner measures the fluorescence and it generates data for thousands of genes. Like there's a lot of information happening all at once. And data analysis is then done to identify the upregulated and the downregulated genes. So the ones that have been turned on or off. And it tells us what process is going on. Genomics extends beyond disease and medicine contributes to advancements in biofuel production through novel enzymes, resulting in increased crop and fuel output, uh, reduced consumer costs. It can aid in better control of microbes using used in biofuel production. It can monitor methods for measuring pollutant impacts on ecosystems. It can help in environmental contamination cleanup. Genomics has facilitated the development of agrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, medical science, agriculture. Let's have a look at the outlook for pharmaceutical treatments based on pharmacogenomics. That, that's a funny word. The right medication can save a life. But a medication that works well for other people might not work for you and may result in significant side effects. Pharmacogenomics is the study of how our genes affect the way our bodies respond to medications. Because of our genetic makeup, some people's bodies break down certain medications too slowly. The medication builds up in the body, causing severe side effects. Other people's bodies break down the same medication too quickly eliminating it before it has a chance to work at effective levels. Yet others may be at risk for having significant, sometimes life-threatening side effects from a medication. Pharmacogenomic testing can identify variations in specific genes related to metabolizing or clearing certain medications from the body. Using this information, doctors can examine your genetic profile to predict whether a medication is likely to help you or hurt you, before you even take it. The goal of pharmacogenomics is to provide the right drug for the right patient at the right dose. For example, if you have high cholesterol, your doctor might prescribe one of many statin medications to lower your risk of a heart attack. But these drugs can also have significant side effects. Finding that out can be expensive, time-consuming, and could delay receiving proper treatment. Pharmacogenomic testing is now available to show how your body is likely to respond to a certain statin. 
That may help your doctor prescribe the right dose of that medication or even a different medication to get the best results for you. Today, pharmacogenomic testing is available, which can help predict how an individual may process and metabolize hundreds of different medications, including those used to treat heart disease, high blood pressure, psychiatric disorders, pain, cancer, and many other conditions. Researchers are continuing to identify more genetic variations that affect the body's response to specific medications. Knowledge that is transforming the practice of healthcare by incorporating this information into your routine clinical practice. Pharmacogenomics, also known as toxicogenomics, assesses drug effectiveness and safety based on the individual's genomic sequence. Genomic responses to drugs are studied using experimental animals or live cells in the lab before doing any kind of human studies. Analyzing changes in gene expression can serve as an early indicator of potential toxic effects. So things like cancerous cell growth, when the genes are involved in cellular growth and controlled cell death are disrupted. Genome-wide studies aid in identifying new genes linked to drug toxicity. Personal genome sequence information allows medical professionals to prescribe medications tailored to the patient's genotype for optimal effectiveness and minimal toxicity. While gene signatures may not be entirely accurate, further testing can be done before symptoms emerge. Metagenomics offers an alternative by studying the collective genomes of multiple species in an environmental niche, and it helps to identify new species more rapidly and analyzes things like pollutant effects on an ecosystem. Microbial genomics has vast untapped potential, providing genes for new enzymes, uh, producing organic compounds, enabling the development of products like antibiotics and a microbial mechanism. Uh, microbial genomics contribute to diagnostic tools, vaccines, disease treatments, environmental cleanup techniques. Um, it's not on here, but there's also mitochondrial DNA that's used for studying evolutionary relationships and tracing genealogy. Uh, forensic science, you have genomic analysis that's used in solving crimes and as evidence in court cases. Um, and then we'll talk, and then of course genomics enhances agricultural research. We've talked about GMOs and crop yields. And finally, proteomics uh, involves the comprehensive study of all the proteins expressed by a specific type of cell under certain environmental conditions. So it's a dynamic field that heavily relies on protein analysis and is frequently employed to investigate various types of cancer. Uh, Genomic and proteomic scale analysis fall under systems biology, which is the study of whole biological systems like genomes and proteomes based on interactions within the system. Um, The European Bioinformatics Institute and the Human Proteome Organization work on effective tools for managing the vast amounts of system biology data. Proteins directly stem from genes and so they reflect genomic activity, making proteomes valuable for identifying proteins and genes involved in diseases. Proteomic data aids in identifying new drugs and understanding their mechanisms of action, especially since pharmaceutical drug trials target proteins. Despite challenges in detecting small protein quantities, mass spectrometry is useful for this purpose. However, discerning variations in protein expression during disease states can still be challenging due to protein's natural instability, making proteomic analysis more difficult than genomic analysis. What they do is they study the genomes and the proteomes in order to comprehend disease genetics. And there is a primary focus on cancer uh, because cancer, again, is not just one disease. It's a whole lot of different diseases with a whole lot of different mechanisms and pathways. And being able to use genomes and proteomes enhances cancer screening and early detection by identifying disease-related protein expression, biomarkers, and individual proteins and protein signatures with altered expression levels. Um, But the current challenge lies in the high rate of false negative results, which is making biomarkers less reliable. Uh, Protein biomarkers like CA125 for ovarian cancer and 
PSA for prostate cancer are used, but protein signatures may offer more reliability in detecting cancer cells. Um, Proteomics is also used to develop personalized treatment plans, predict drug responses, and um, predicting potential side effects. The National Cancer Institute programs, such as Clinical Proteomic Technologies for Cancer and Early Detection Research Network, aim to identify cancer-specific protein signatures and design effective therapies. Proteomics is sort of like genomics, you know, where uh, genomics is the study of all the genes in a organism. Well, study of all the human proteins is proteomics, or study of all the proteins that get expressed in our bodies. You know, of course, a protein, I think everybody knows, you know, it's the amino acid string that gets folded up and goes off and does a job in your body, that's a protein. But that's not high enough resolution. When you really go into the molecular level of our bodies, um, a single human gene can create dozens or even hundreds or low thousands of subtly different versions of the protein. And those the world has come to call different forms of the protein or proteoforms for short. And it's really clear that the human proteome is made up of all the proteoforms. We would like to create the reference proteome that would have all the subproteomes as components of it. So we would do the liver cell types and the brain cell types and the kidney cell types. So we want to determine the proteomes of all of those cell types. Because they, there is a large number of decorations, or as we say in proteomics, PTMs, post-translational modification. If you phosphorylate a serine or you methylate an arginine, you are creating derivatives of a protein. We call those proteoforms. So, so the proteome is a bit different. It's not just the linear sequence. We actually need to determine those decorations, quantify those, and that's why it gets complicated. But basically what we're talking about is defining uh, something on the order of 50 to 100 million unique proteoforms in the human proteoform project. This concludes the lesson eight material. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.